Well, open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke, and we'll be again this morning in chapter 18. <clears throat> We're wrapping up our series in this Gospel with the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. Uh, I think this is a very fitting conclusion because in this parable, Jesus conveys a message that is not only central to the gospel of Luke, although it certainly is, but he conveys a message that is really central to the entire Bible and the whole of Christian faith. And that, it, that is that the proud who rely on themselves are judged, but the humble who rely on God's mercy are justified. Let's read it together. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is God's word. Uh, this parable reminds me of uh, one day when I went for a walk. And when I got home, I uh, walked through the front door and there was this awful smell in the entryway. I just immediately started trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm looking under cabinets and in, in, into the closet and, and I couldn't locate the smell. And so I walked back into the kitchen and, and started to sort out, okay, what, is it coming from back here? Is there some food that's been left out? Is it the trash? Nobody was in there for me to ask, but it smelled just as bad in there. And again, could not locate it. So I go upstairs and I track down my wife in the bedroom and I'm like, babe, it smells, it even smells up here, this whole house reeks like what is going on well of course she promptly pointed out the stain on my shoes that had left a stain on the rug yeah it tracked that stain down the stairs and through the kitchen and around into the entryway because at some point along the way on my walk I had uh, tracked something that a dog left behind and now brought it all the way through the house I think that's what it's like when you and I are being spiritually proud, you can smell sin everywhere, but the stink is on you. <laughs> Been there. Parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, I think, is one of the most familiar and rightly so beloved parables in the Bible. Because it's so familiar, I think we often fail probably to apply it to ourselves in the ways that we should. Uh, one author, I love, described this parable as a comfortable old slipper that other people wear. In other words, it's familiar to us, but it's familiar as a story we assume only applies to other people. And I think each of us needs to try on this slipper today for ourselves. I know I do. Each of us at one point or another has been caught in the throes of spiritual pride. No doubt, given the size of this room and the frequency of the emergence of the sin in our hearts, some of us are ensnared in it in a particular way right now. And so let me just stop us before we get any further. If you're inclined to think that this is for someone else, it is most definitely for you. Um, I think the gracious discomfort of this parable, if we will let it function in that way, can open our eyes 
but also bend our hearts in a fresh way toward Christ. This parable warns against the grave dangers of spiritual pride. And it calls you and I to humble reliance on God's mercy. So we're going to look, through it, look at it through three pairs. First, two problems, then two prayers, and then two answers. Two problems, two prayers, two answers. First up, two problems. These two problems that are identified at the very beginning of the parable are the, what you might consider the twin children of the sin of spiritual pride. And the first one is the problem of self-righteousness. Verse 9, it says, He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. Here's where it gets tricky. As I said, nobody thinks they're self-righteous. Uh, in fact, in our day, I would say we actually so prize authenticity and despise people who act holier than thou, we're much more likely to sort of turn this parable around. Uh, to be people who pray something, Lord, thank you that I am not like that Pharisee over there. That guy is so full of himself. But man, I'm a mess, but at least I'm real, right? Well, the irony of, of even that dynamic is that boasting in your authenticity is just another form of self-righteousness. It's just applied to a different standard, the standard of authenticity rather than morality. If the audience of this parable is self-righteous people, but nobody's self-righteous, it's got no audience. We all might as well just close our Bibles and go home. But in fact, self-righteousness is alive and well. As I said, we just tend to be blind to it. It is a sin that especially clouds self-awareness. So I think we do well to consider for a moment what is self-righteousness. What's it look like? <clears throat> the problem <clears throat> of self-righteousness is a problem of misplaced trust. It says it right there in verse 9. Instead of trusting God, the self-righteous person trusts in themselves. They wrongly believe that they are sufficiently righteous on their own without need of help from God. They are deceived into thinking that their spiritual performance is impeccable. So they have no need to trust God. Their righteous actions speak for themselves. The currency in the nation of self-righteousness says, in me I trust. Now here are a few signs <clears> that you and I might be being self-righteous. One is, if you think you don't need anyone's help to obey God. If you are trusting in yourself, you can't trust others. Uh, you, can, you can manage righteousness on your own. Uh, you don't need anybody else's perspective on your heart and life. Uh, you've got this. Uh, you don't need fellowship. You don't need accountability. You don't need counsel. Uh, you just need to be left alone to live out your righteousness with the occasional show of support and appreciation. You also might be self-righteous if you find yourself vigorously defending your behavior. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times to simply state the case when we've been wrongly accused. But when self-righteousness takes hold in our hearts, we become deeply defensive. Because if you are trusting in yourself and in your own righteousness... You can't let yourself be proven wrong. Uh, that would undermine the very foundation of what you are trusting in. So you never admit fault. You never recognize your contributions to problems in your relationships. You never focus on your own repentance and growth because that would be, in a sense, cutting down the limb your faith is hanging on. So you vigorously defend 
your behavior. Another sign is that your standards reflect you instead of God. The standards you are holding yourself to and others to reflect you rather than God. The cold, hard reality is that each and every one of us, every human being who's ever lived, falls short of the glory of God. And the Bible tells us in Romans 1 that deep down we actually all know it. But if you are caught in the throes of self-righteousness and your fallenness that is mere fact somehow uh, gets revealed beyond your ability to defend yourself, then you have to swap out the standard. This is one of the ironies of self-righteousness, that in order to maintain the facade, you actually have to set standards that are lower than God's but seem attainable to you. This is what Jesus accused the Pharisees of when he said they would strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. You'll fixate on keeping the standards you know you can keep. But you'll pretend the bigger commands you're violating don't really matter all that much. <clears throat> Let me just give you some examples. You will keep your home immaculate. But you will demean the people who live in it. You will provide faithfully for your household. And you will neglect the people in it relationally. You will show up on time to work. You will knock out your task list. But you'll gossip about your coworkers and cheat on your taxes and justify it. In general, you'll show people mercy in areas where you struggle, although you wouldn't call it a struggle. But you demand perfection of others in areas where you're strong. If you're self-righteous, you're, the standards will reflect you instead of God so that you and I can fool ourselves into thinking that we're actually keeping them well. There's one more sign of self-righteousness. It is if you are rarely convicted but occasionally devastated. Hang with me here. If your entire sense of spiritual stability is built on the foundation of your own spiritual performance, when any failure is just unmistakably exposed, your stability goes with it. So in your life, there's then no normal rhythm of recognizing instances of sin, of experiencing godly grief over sin of confessing that sin to God and to others, uh, of repenting of that sin, of finding hope in the gospel and taking hold of Christ and his mercy for grace to change. That process should be a very regular and normal part of a healthy Christian life. But instead, self-righteous people will go long stretches of time feeling superior until that superiority is revealed as false by some grossly undeniable sin, where it is then punctuated by stretches of feeling utterly worthless. Rather than conviction, they are devastated. Until, that is, such a person feels that they have, again, sufficiently proved themselves to be righteous to have pulled themselves up by their moral bootstraps, then we're right back in to spiritual pride. If you find yourself rarely convicted, but occasionally devastated, warning, that may be an expression of self-righteousness. And as you can imagine, uh, these kinds of ways of living and conceiving of yourself then have significant impact on our relationships. And that's what Luke points out next in verse 9. The second problem this par parable confronts is, as I said, the twin, uh, evil twin of self-righteousness. And that is contempt. 
Verse 9 says, he told this parable to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and who treated others with contempt. Those two things, and we'll see it all the more as we go through it, they go hand in hand. A person who views themselves as being without sin looks down on people who do sin, which is, by the way, everybody. Now here, I'll be more brief, but just a few signs that your self-righteousness is growing into contempt. Your eye is, is quickly drawn to the faults in other people rather than the good. Your thoughts and conversations about other people regularly revolve around their shortcomings. You complain about them in your heart. You laugh at their failures. You are quick to talk about your indignation with others. Your eyes quickly drawn to the faults in others. Another one is you're, you're quick to shift blame on others rather than take responsibility yourself. When your behavior is questioned, if your own justification is at stake, you can't just let that charge stick. If that's what you're trusting in, you have to get rid of it. And so you deflect those charges to the people around you. As Jesus will, again, point out elsewhere, you've got a log jammed in your eye, but you are furiously pointing out the specks in everybody else's. Third, you will compare yourself favorably to others. Everything's about performance spiritually. You've got to pull other people down in order to lift yourself up. So you find yourself saying things like, I would never do that. I would never. I would never watch something like that. I would never go somewhere like that. I would never say something like that. And there's, there's little to no recognition that who you are, you are by the grace of God for the glory of God. There's just a, a shock at what others do and a refusal to think that you could ever do the same. Or on the other side, maybe you comfort yourself with internal reassurances. Like I always do X, fill in the blank. I, I read my Bible every day. I'm in church every Sunday. I'm always respectful of others. I always volunteer. I'm always working hard for God's mission. I'm always at the prayer meetings. I'm always out supporting my kids. And the subtext is other people aren't. And my record of doing them is stellar. Friends, all those things are good things that you would be reassuring yourself of, but none of them earns us mercy from God. And none of them makes us better than other people. So friends, these kinds of tendencies are things we can all be susceptible to. And Jesus gives us this parable to confront those twin evils of self-righteousness and contempt. Maybe that comfortable slipper other people wear is getting a little bit better fixed onto our own feet. Next, Jesus gives us two prayers. Two prayers. It says in verse 10, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. Now, <laughs> these figures are so common to us now on uh, way on the other side of the cross, that I think we can lose a sense of how Jesus' original hearers would have perceived these two characters. The Pharisees were the most popular and esteemed religious figures of their day, bar none. If they had had religious podcasts and religious radio and religious best-selling books and religious news outlets back, in, back then. The personalities that would have dominated the, the top ten lists in all these markets would have been Pharisees. These people were highly regarded for their understanding of the Bible, for their teaching of the Bible, and for their application of the Bible to themselves and to others. 
Now, tax collectors, on the other hand, were exactly the opposite. No one was thought of as more religiously despised than a tax collector. They were worse than the pagans in Rome, worse than the pure sinners in Israel. Because they were not only sinful, they were uh, kind of creepy about it. Uh, They pretended to be good Jews, but they extorted the Jews on behalf of their Roman oppressors. They were rich and greedy and powerful and traitorous and oppressive. Now you expect, if you're a Jew in Jesus' day, the Romans to act like that, to be oppressive and ungodly. But to experience these things from your own people was just unconscionable. And that was the tax collector. Both of those two climb Mount Zion in this parable to pray at the temple. Now, public prayers were offered up twice a day in the temple, once in the morning, 9 a.m., and once late afternoon. The rest of the day, this was a place of prayer. People came to pray privately. And so, no surprise in Jesus' story that these two come. Now, as they walk up Mount Zion and enter the temple, the Pharisee could not be more in his element. I mean, this is an NBA player on the basketball court. This is a politician at a rally. This is a a CEO in a boardroom. He He is in his domain. This is where the Pharisee does his thing. The tax collector is a fish out of water. He's been here, no doubt, but it's been a long time. Uh, Not as often as he should. On his way into the temple, no doubt, he's uh, bumping into people. He's he's frauded. He's passing by people. He's extorted who can't imagine why in the world this guy would be there unless it was to rip somebody else off. He is a profane man in a sacred space. Everyone listening to Jesus would have been thinking, this Pharisee deserves VIP treatment. And the tax collector deserves like side eye. Like, why is this guy here? But then Jesus describes the way each of these two prays. First, the prayer of the proud. Verse 11, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. Both of these prayers, Luke notes the the posture and the petition, how the, the prayer acts and what he asks. The Pharisee's posture is especially noteworthy. It says he stands by himself. Now, that isn't saying that he's standing alone. It's saying that he stands out. Uh, Likely, he stands up in front of others who were sitting or kneeling. His posture's confident. He's praying with swagger before he even opens his mouth. Now, as for his petition, what is shocking about the Pharisee's request is that he doesn't make any requests. He prays and asks God for absolutely nothing. Apparently, he has all he needs within himself. He's good to go. Instead of petitioning God, he stands in the temple and prays a prayer of praise to himself. He says, I, five times. And he he doesn't just praise his own moral purity. He praises himself in comparison to other people. And he does it in these categorical terms. He doesn't say, Lord, I'm glad I haven't committed extortion. He says, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not an extortioner like other men. I'm so glad I'm not unjust like other men. I'm so glad I'm not an adulterer like other men. He takes the sins of others and he labels them with it. 
He doesn't call them by their name. He calls them by their sin. The self-righteous don't deal with people as people. They deal with people as problems. And that is on full display here. Then, once he distinguishes himself for his moral purity vis-a-vis others, he extols his own virtues. Not only has he not done some things he shouldn't do, he's uh, done things he should do and more. First, he notes fasting. Fasting in the Bible, in the Old Testament, for the people of God, for the Jews, is only required one day a year, the Day of Atonement. He fasts twice a week. What the Bible calls him to do once a year, he does 104 times a year. Then he points out his tithing. The Bible calls the people of God to tithe, to give a 10% of the fruit of their labors. He gives not only based on what he's earned, he tithes, it says, on all he receives. Not just his paycheck, he tithes his birthday money, kids. He, he tithes his retirement check. He tithes on his tax refund. Like everything that's coming in, he's given a tithe. In these areas, man, this guy went above and beyond. Hey, all good. The problem is that he fails to see the ways he inevitably falls short in a myriad of ways. So he trusts in himself instead of God, and he boasts in himself while he belittles other people. That's the first prayer. The second prayer is the prayer of the humble. It's in verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Again, Luke notes his posture and his petition, how he acts, what he asks. His posture, he he is not standing in front of a crowd like the Pharisee. His prayer is not a performance. He is doing business with God. And so he is alone with God. He's primarily aware, it seems, of God's gaze, not the eyes of other people. He won't look up like the Pharisee because he is grieved by his sin. His very placement in the temple and his physical posture demonstrates that he is aware of God. He is reckoning with God. He is not preoccupied with the eyes of others. And then he asks in his petition for one thing. Mercy. He doesn't pray for a blessing. Lord, help me collect more taxes this year. He doesn't even pray for help to stop doing these things, although that would certainly be appropriate, and there will be a time for that. First and foremost, he prays that the one he knows he ultimately must answer to would have mercy on him in his sin. The Pharisee is primarily aware of himself. This tax collector shows us that he is primarily aware of, of God. And we can only assume that he makes this bold request for the mercy of God because he believes that God is merciful. That he's heard somewhere that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. When he's overcome with his sin, he comes and calls on God for mercy. Now, Jesus' audience would no doubt have been wondering, (laughs) what does God think about all this? Jesus is flipping stuff upside down. The way they had these characters worked out is, is slowly unraveling. And that's when Jesus delivers the bombshell in verse 14. God answers these two prayers with two answers in verse 14. I tell you, this man, that is the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. So when these two men 
walked down from the Temple Mount, headed for home. The man who cried out for mercy had received it. And the man who trusted in himself got exactly what he asked for. Nothing. Jesus uses an interesting term to describe what the tax collector experienced. He says he was justified. To be justified means to be declared by someone else as righteous. It's, it's courtroom type language. It's, it's legal language. It's a pronouncement by someone else of not guilty. But how in this man's case? Through fasting and tithing? Through uh, avoiding extortion and avoiding injustice and avoiding adultery? No. Justification by God is impossible by sheer moral improvement. The standards are too high and our ability to keep it far too low. Justification, that is a declaration of righteous before God, comes through faith alone in Christ alone. The only prerequisite for receiving the grace of God is recognizing that you need it. And this man went down knowing he needed it. And Jesus says he received it. And so it is with us. It's no surprise that this parable was one of the favorites of Martin Luther. He preached on it dozens of times. And in one of those sermons, he says this. The love of God does not find but creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of God loves sinners, evil persons, fools, and weaklings in order to make them righteous, good, wise, and strong. Rather than seeking its own good, the love of God flows forth and bestows good. Therefore, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They are not loved because they are attractive. Then Jesus looks further forward. This man was justified in that moment because he had received the mercy of God simply because he asked God for it. But then he says, to close the parable, for everyone who exalts himself will be, looking ahead, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That sentence is actually a bookend on this entire section of Luke that we've been walking through for the last couple of months. It's mentioned uh, previously in chapter 14 where we started, and it closes the section today. It's repeated word for word. And in many ways, it is the theme of it all. Whether it's been a parable addressing the rich or the powerful, the, the self-promoting or the self-righteous, the weary or the selfish, the message boils down to that same truth. God exalts those who humbly rely on him. And he humbles those who exalt themselves. For whatever reason, whether they prop themselves up on their money or their status or their comfort or their power, the issue is they rely on these things instead of relying on God. And Jesus takes what is the most common religious notion in the world, both then and now, and completely turns it on its head. That is the notion that a person can be right with God by doing the right things. That I can behave my way into God's good graces. That idea is central to almost every world religion, and it's the default concept, I think, of even most nominally religious people today. But that is completely the opposite of the teaching of Jesus. The message that you cannot get right with God through your religious performance alone is taught all the way through Scripture and all the way through Jesus' ministry. So what does this parable mean for us? This parable teaches us how to get right with God. 
If you are someone here who is trying to sort all this out, maybe you're early in your journey of trying to follow Jesus, this is the first and most important step. Cast yourself on the mercy of God. Recognize that you have rebelled against God, gone your own way. You have lived for yourself and denied him. But also know that God is a merciful God, slow to anger, abounding, as I said, in steadfast love. And if you ask him for mercy, you will receive it. But this parable also teaches those of us who've been around the block of Christianity for a little while. It shows us how to continue to relate with God. That is humbly. Now to be clear, humble does not mean self-deprecating. It doesn't mean that we kind of walk around putting ourselves down all the time. To live our lives humbly as Christians means we live our lives joyfully aware of the fact that our standing with God is all of grace. If I can say it like this, Christian, the gospel frees you to get over yourself. And it is, it is so freeing. It is so freeing to not be a big deal. It is so freeing to not have a facade to maintain or a self-justification to keep secure. You can rest in the justification of God that you secure simply by relying on the mercy of God. And that changes things. All of a sudden, you are freed to take criticism. You are freed to acknowledge and repent of sin and change. You're freed to serve others. You're freed to focus on the important stuff rather than trying to keep every I dotted and T crossed on the things that you can do. You're freed to serve others and love them as Christ has loved you because your eternity is not hanging in the balance of your performance. It is secure in the mercy of God of Christ. That has radical implications for your marriage. Radical implications for your parenting. Radical implications for your work life. Radical implications for your relationships in the life of the church. Radical implications for your life with your neighbors. When you are freed of the need to justify yourself, you can live in the joy of being justified by God. 